Hi there. Hi, Hi Michael. Can you, can you hear me okay? I hear you fine. Cool, man. Cool. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Um, really appreciate it. Thank you for what you do. No, it's thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for your uh, for coming along, and I really appreciate that. Um, hi, um, uh, Budimpa. Um, I forget how to. I forget. Uh, you told me already. Um, how to pronounce his name? I, I do apologize. Can you write me, please? Can you hear me, uh, Budimpa? Not sure if you can hear me. Okay, no worries. Um. Hi, can you remind me how to pronounce your name? I'm so sorry. Budimpa? Buddha? Uh, I'm not sure if you can hear me. I think she's connecting. Um, can you remind me how to say name, your name, please? Hi, this is Bopindo. Yeah, how do you pronounce it, though? Like you said, it was like you could just call you like Boo or something Bo. like that. Bo. Say, Bo. Bo. Cool. Just cool. B-O-Bo. Bo. Cool, man. Thank you so much. Beautiful glasses. I, mean, I don't think you were wearing them last time. Thank you. Um, sorry, I've been missing any action. Yeah, it's fine. It? Whatever. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> you got blue glasses. I really like those glasses. Thank you. I got those recently. Cool, man. You look really cool. Okay. So basically, I'm going to try and talk about some um, portfolio construction. And I'm going to go through um, four topics. So... I try to structure this as, you know, because everyone kind of invests in the kind of in their own way, and that's fine. But there are some kind of frameworks that I think are really, really helpful. And you know, whether whatever style you're doing, whether you're kind of buying growth stocks or dividend stocks, or like however you you formulate your portfolio with a lot of stocks or not many stocks, there's some frameworks that I think that uh, are quite helpful to think about. So, you know, whenever you're trying to um, do something meaningful, you know, like Charlie Mungo uh, had an interview um, recently on a podcast called Acquired. And I think he said, he said several times throughout the interview, but I've heard this, him say this so many other times. He says that making money shouldn't be easy. You know, it, there's no logical reason why it should be easy. It is difficult, but there are some people that have accomplished this and you don't need to have their type of performance, but what you're trying to do in this journey is not lose buying power, really. That's really what you want. You know, you kind of, you're trying to invest in a way that when you look back five, six years from now, you're not looking back and say, oh my God, you know, like I had so much money or whatever. Hey, what am I going to do now? Like you're trying to put in effort, you know, investing is hard work. And I mean, I I, I can't imagine why it, like it shouldn't be, you know, um, you're trying to just get some exposure to an asset or assets that are going to have as much as or more power to purchase stuff three, four years out. So what you are trying to do is you're trying to put capital to work today. You're deferring the capital that you could spend today, hoping that in two or three years time, it's worth a tiny bit more, right? That's really it. Now, this is all about a journey and it's about having the correct expectations. And I think, you know, I, I had a holiday just now and I went to Barcelona and I was there, I was there with my family. And when I was growing up, um, we, you know, in Portugal, it's one of those countries, a bit like, um, a bit like Russia, but some like other countries as well. Where there's there's a lot of running jokes. There's low like it's it's, it's those type of uh, countries that have always a lot of jokes. Like uh, Americans and Britons uh, very similar in that sense. They don't have a lot of jokes. There's some standard comedians, but the community as a whole isn't a bunch of jokers. Everyone always has a joke in Portugal um, and in Russia as well. It's everything. Uh, and and in Portugal, I remember when I was growing up, 
the jokes were always like there was always three people like there was like two Portuguese because they were in Portugal two Portuguese and a Brazilian and the butt of the joke was always the Brazilian like everything went wrong it was the Brazilian like every, all the jokes were like that and I look back now and I went to Barcelona and it's a vibrant this is Spain not, not Brazil but it's a vibrant economy and everything and I look back and I was talking to my family I was like do you remember that not that long ago all the jokes were about the Brazilians. And now I think myself, well, you know, Brazil is like coming up to being like a mega power. It's not like, it's, it's not like, it's still got a lot of trials and tribulations, a lot of stuff. But I don't think that those jokes today would resonate as much because the Portuguese have been, just been left behind and the Brazilians have just overtaken them. And, you know, this is just drove home to me the importance of, compounding and that kind of it just takes so long but then you look back and you're like wow you know flip an egg like what's going on like how come brazil is where it's at and another example that i'll just i'm kind of waffling but i'm just going to go very quickly for this is when i'm working with my daughter my wife uh, my daughter she walks very slowly she's young she walks really really slow really slow trust me man though and Sometimes, you know, I've done this before. I kind of, I'm like, she's walking, I'm kind of shopping. I'm like, I see my shoelaces undone. I'm like, oh, you guys go on ahead. I'll just step back and I'll do my shoelaces. And I step down, put the bags down, I'm like heavy bags, relax my shoulders, do the shoelaces, get back, the bags back up. And next thing I notice, like they're at the end of that road. So they just didn't stop. They just kept on going very slowly. But because they didn't stop, they got really far ahead. And this is again about that compounding, you know, like compounding takes time, but it can really deliver miracles over time. And this is what I want to talk about portfolio construction. So uh, I've said this story before, but I think it's an important story. Um, the way that a person should invest, in my opinion, is that you should start with the idea that you've already reached your financial targets. Let's say you want to make a thousand or a million pounds or whatever, million dollars, whatever. You start that frame of mind that you already have that capital and you're working hard to preserve your buying power over time, okay? So rather than you trying to get rich and you kind of like, you know, I see a lot, I, see, I speak to a lot of investors and I, you know, I'm around a lot and I see some traits. And the biggest problem that I see, and I've been guilty of this, you know, I've done this mistake, but I, I like I'm hoping that I can pass on my experience because I've seen this happen to myself and to others. And I'm hoping that you can learn this from my experience so that you don't repeat this mistake, is that a lot of people try to make it in the market. There's a lot of very smart people working around the clock, teams of them with computers and AI and this and that. And that. And they're all trying to fight each other on what is this zero-sum game where you're trying to buy something that somebody's selling and they're just as smart as you. Or you're trying to sell something that they're trying to buy. So it just cancels each other out. And a better way is to think, okay, I have my target, I have my money, and I'm trying to stick to compounding, slow and steady. What you're trying... And I thought a lot about this. The problem with investing is when you um, take yourself out of the market, you know, and I'm sure we all can remember that, you know, things look sour. It's like, oh God, you're going to be crazy like this and that. And I'm not talking about an individual position. Okay. I'm not saying like, oh, you bought Airbnb, it's not working out. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying the portfolio is your asset, and you have bought a position in those companies, and you have the right to the earnings powers of those company, proportional to obviously the number of shares you have. So you want to stay with that. And whether the, the business is going for a good time or a bad time, you want to stay there. And an example that I can think of is, you know, Last October, things looked really scary, man. Like it was like, oh, thing. I was just like, it was, it was just like, it looked awful. 
And now we look back and it's like, man, you know, it was nothing. It's like, come gone. We're, we're already on to the next October. And and the market is again, you know, kind of having a bit of a shaky leg. But a lot of those companies are just kind of, yeah, they kind of went down. They went up and they went back down. But a lot of people ended up coming in as soon as things all improved, like in May, June, July. Oh, it's like the market's coming back, you know, uh, COVID period, 2020, 0% interest rates are coming back. And people kind of didn't, they were trying to, you know, time to how they believe rather than staying with the business. And this is something that is, I, I think is so important is things take time, you know, and you need to know what type of investor you really want to be. And you need to have that, that discussion with yourself outside of market hours. Because what happens is that you during the week, you know, you've read something on something and it's kind of like agitating you and it's you're not in the right emotional state. And it's important to have a conversation with people that you trust and you respect and yourself and, you know, really what am I trying to accomplish? And in a non-judgmental type of way, say, okay, I think that I want to um, be an investor, uh, but I have difficulty because I kind of buy and sell too much. Recognize that. Say, okay, this is my fault. I do this, you know, take ownership of that kind of and say, okay, rather than buying and selling too quickly, why don't I make some rules for myself? Like I say to myself, okay, I don't want to enter a position all at once and I don't want to exit a position all at once. Now, things sometimes happen. Like I said, um, I owned this company, Arch Resources, and I was with it for a dividend stock and that's what I wanted. I was like, oh yeah, I'm really excited. It's a very high dividend. And something clearly changed there that was outside of my control. And I had to exit that all at once. So I was breaking that rule that I made. But I was very cognizant that this is my rule that I'm breaking. And whether I'm right or wrong in hindsight, we'll see. But the reasons why I broke that rule is because I wanted that kind of a bit of that sanity that comes from having a dividend stock. It's having a little bit of cash coming in. And uh, you often find that dividend stocks don't really perform like growth stocks. And just giving me that sanity to stay with my portfolio so that's the really the first rule that i want to talk about like try and think about investing not from the presence that i'm trying to make something that i'm trying to keep something okay and i think that um you know these things are very easy to say and i, I recognize that they're difficult but this it's a truism you know it's difficult to time the market and it may have been, I don't know, I was never there, but it may have been easier like in the 70s and 80s when there was like less computers going around. I don't know, I wasn't there, but I can tell you that it's really difficult right now. The market is very choppy and you don't want to lead yourself to thinking, okay, now it's safe to come in, you know? Just spread out the investments, spread them out. I always say at least four to six weeks apart, buy a little bit, it's okay to keep some cash on the side, you know, just, and, ease in and ease out of a position. I think that that is having these rules. So I gave myself this rule that I kind of need to have at least four to six weeks between buying into a company because uh, you really get to know about a company, really get to know about a business. And the more that you um, spend with the company, the more you understand the company. Now it gives you kind of the stamina to stay with that business. Um, so for example, I... I um, I recommended the stock Hims, Hims and Hers, and it was doing really well for me. Went from four dollars to twelve dollars, doing really well, and now it's back to five. And I'm like, wow, man, this is devastating. It's really annoying, it's really frustrating. But I've been with this company. I've been following it before I was investing in it. I was, I, 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 it's like nearly three years that oh, two and a half or so that I've just been following this company, following this company, following this company, and I don't fall for like management. I always, I've said this one to you, George, before that uh, uh, that management has the, the Charlie Munger, and I'm going to use this because it's Charlie's speech, but uh, that when management is talking, they're lying, and when they're quiet, they're stealing. 
And I, I take that. This is my boilerplate. I like it. I don't trust this. Whatever they say, management CEO of the company has one job. He has one role. His role is to influence everyone around him to buy into his story. Okay? So you're the CEO of the company. Too. You need to get your employees to believe you. You need your stakeholders to believe you. And you need your shareholders to believe in you. So you need to convince everyone. Obviously, convince yourself as well. Uh, see, that's your job. So I understand that. So I, I don't like to buy into narratives. But I do like to spend a lot of time thinking about the business's fundamentals. You know, what are they trying to achieve and how are they uh, developing over time? So even when things don't go my way, because I, you know, in the ideal scenario, the stock goes up 15% per year and there's no kind of drama along the way and everything is hunky-dory. But there are times when things don't go that way and you need to understand what you own and you need to understand and be clear with everyone, yourself included, what type of investor really you are. If it's, there's nothing wrong with being a short-term investor, nothing wrong with being a long-term investor, you just need to know, okay, this is what I am and this is what I'm going to do. And put rules in place so that you can stay the course. So um, I want to also uh, just highlight one more thing. So um, we've talked about safeguarding the capital and this is really kind of um, Buffett's rule number one, you know, never lose money. I just think that it's important to understand that, you know, Warren has also made mistakes, you know, like he, he made the investments in, Many retailers over time, obviously, and the famous stories about airlines. And um, um, there was the, the the brokerage firm in the nineties, uh, Solomon or whatever it's called. Uh, so, you know, he will also make mistakes. So th this this rule is just to get you thinking. Think about the business quality. And for me, personally, I find the best way to try and understand the business is if the business is stable, okay? I don't mean that it's kind of like, everyone wants to buy into a secular growth until it turns out that secular growth wasn't actually a secular growth. Um, but everyone wants to kind of buy into the secular winners. Rather than trying to buy into a secular winner, try and buy into businesses quite stable and predictable. And it's only kind of maybe chopping along quite reasonably. It's quite easy to kind of think, okay, it's been doing this and over the next uh, 12 months it's going to do that. And start from that, like what kind of valuation am I paying relative to the growth that I'm expecting? I use this rule that I believe um, is quite helpful. I got it from Peter Lynch as a one to two ratio. So for example, if the company is growing, let's say its earnings per share at let's say uh, 15%, don't pay more than 30 times earnings, okay? Ideally, you want to pay as little as possible, obviously. So, for example, I just wrote now it's the top of my mind. I just wrote about uh, Google. So that business, I think, it could probably grow at 15% its earnings next year. There's plenty of wiggle room in terms of the balance sheet. And, you know, there's things that could go right in a business. There's things that could go wrong. So 15% is kind of reasonable. And the valuation, according to my estimates, around... 19 times earnings so that's that's fair you know it's okay it's, it's growing at 15 and it's, it's um and you're paying around 19 20 times earnings okay it's, it's less than a one to two ratio uh i believe in my opinion that it's cheaper than the other mega caps but there's a framework that i'm trying to think okay this is like what it can do i'm trying to think about what it's going to do next year and add a bit of a room for error and start from there i think that that is something that uh, helps you as an investor think about building a portfolio. Okay, so I'm going to move forward. Um, the way that I think, so this is point three, um, the way that I think about investing is the same amount of research that I would do to buy a home. So when you buy a home, um, you spend quite a bit of time. Like, I don't know if uh, in recently you kind of uh, sold and bought a home. Man, it's everything. You 
You go and check the houses. You go and even check the cars on the street. Like I do that. I'm like, you know, it's like, well, should we go and uh, look around the neighborhood in the nighttime? And oh, it's like, just kind of pass it through the day, see what's like. You spend quite a bit of time deliberating that. And it's, the work is the preparation before you buy. It's not like, oh, you know, um, earnings are out, results look good. Um, get a grasp for the business that you're buying into before you buy into. Because what happens is that sometimes these earnings look really good. The outlook looks really good, but it's that is it. That, that is There's the one quarter and that's it. But by following this business uh, over time, you get a better grasp for it. And I also believe that a lot of mistakes that investors do is that they only buy into businesses that they use. I know that's the Peter Lynch way, and that's okay, but there are plenty of businesses that have strong moats, like they have strong competitive advantages that you may not be very familiar with. I don't, like, I, I, I don't know if you want to, but for example, like there's a specific, uh, I don't know, like accounting software or something, you know, like you don't really use it in your day-to-day -day or I don't know, like an advertising um, business or whatever. You don't really use it. Those businesses sometimes can be quite interesting because they make quite a lot of cash flow. And as long as you're not paying a lot for those cash flows, things may work out, you know? You never really know for certain. And I gave you the example of... Um, Warren, you know, with the airline and stuff, this is a relatively simple business, but you know, sometimes things just don't work out and life gets in the way. But spend a bit of time in the preparation. The preparation is where the money is made. The money is made in the preparation. Once you've done the preparation, the stock is kind of half sold. Like you need to just, if you get a good price point, if you buy it well, it's half sold. So that's the work you need to put in to understand what you're buying and, and, and so that you can stay with the business. I think that's important. Okay, now um, this is point four. I wrote this one for you, Arsi Boo, uh, because I, um, I know that you uh, own a lot of stocks and I spent a lot of time thinking about this. So um, Ch Charlie Mung, as I said, had a, a, a podcast recently and um, he, uh, remind it kind of came up at the back of my mind that he would only have around um four or five stocks when he was running his own um uh, partnership back in the days and some of the best investors have very highly concentrated portfolios but those individuals are exceptions these are exceptional people they're working 70 80 hours a week no family that's just like focused and i think that you know it's better to be honest with yourself and say you know i have at this moment in time the commitments and i can't or you know haven't got uh, the iq of charlie manga that at 99 can really go from talking about china to talking about bitcoin in like in a sentence uh, like so that's one extreme but to go to the other extreme also causes difficulties because you don't know what you own. Like say, if you own more than let's say 30, 35 stocks, like, like oh, what was that business again? Oh, like, uh, like well, I don't even know what the sticker was. Uh, like, I have some enjoyment of the fruits that you are collecting over time. You're collecting those fruits, those assets. Try and understand what is the direction the business is going. I think that is helpful because if you're familiar with what they're trying to do, you are more likely to stay with it because that's the problem that I have find is that a lot of investors have short-term horizons. And so let me refresh this, right? A lot of investors are buy and hold forever as long as the share price is going up. But when the market dips, like, oh, sell, sell, sell. Now, I think that having, let's say, I believe in my opinion around 12, 13 to 20 stocks. I think that's a, a reasonable amount. You've got some diversification there, you know. Uh, if something goes really crazy, you're going to lose around, you know, um, if it goes to zero, you're going to lose around 6 or 7% of your portfolio. Most likely, most stocks, in my experience, I've seen a lot of bankruptcies in my time. 
And bankruptcies rarely happen overnight. You, it's kind of like you, you've got plenty of time to kind of wake up and smell the coffee. So even if things go really, really bad and you end up selling at, let's say, at a 50% loss, that obviously you need a double on the next one to break even. That's, that's obviously the case. But even if in that case, you're probably only going to lose about 3.5% of your overall portfolio if you have, let's say, 10, 12, 15 stocks. So what you're trying to do at all this way is build yourself to have staying power in the market. You don't want to kind of be in a position where you're having to be nervous and it's eating you away because the share price is down. You're like you, you want to just stay with it. Um, and I'll go on to my final point that I think it's really important um, when you buy into some stocks that you don't put um, more than 20% into any, any one stock. I think that uh, no matter how alluring the stock is. The second one, which I think is really, really important is to remember that stocks don't go up or down in a straight line. You know, uh, you kind of feel like, oh, it's going up a lot, shall I sell or whatever? Like, you know, just, just kind of figure out how long you've held it. If you only held it for a few months and the stock has gone up a lot, okay, call yourself grateful. It may take a breather. It's very likely the stock will take a breather at some point, but stay with it, okay? Just kind of give the business time to unfold. And um, finally, I'm just going to talk about um, try to get in your portfolio exposure to different parts of the economy. So by what I mean by that is don't only have, let's say, for example, um, energy stocks or tech stocks or ha have a bit of different things in the portfolio because the market kind of gets enchanted with, so it gets attracted to certain trends that are happening. It's like, oh, tech is down, oh, tech is up. And you you end up chasing these things because oh, everyone's talking up about it and it's like, for six, seven weeks that the tech is going up. It's like, oh, it's the new bull market and blah, blah, blah. And I believe it's better to have lower expectations and more aligned with your personality so that you can stay and enjoy the process. Um, and just to summarize everything up, I think that investing is really about the growth of your personality, you know, um, enjoy this process. Um, I uh, I spent a lot of time reading, and I was at the um, at the Markel meeting a few weeks ago in London. And um, uh, when they were talking about, um, you know, people always ask them like, if uh, shareholders always ask, oh, what kind of things are you reading? People always want to know what is someone else reading, and. Charlie Mungo will always say, I only read um, facts, uh, fact, factual books. Um, and, and the CEO of Markel said, you know, I know that Charlie only reads that, but I actually think that it's important to read quite a lot of fiction as well because it teaches you empathy. Now, obviously, the CEO of Markel and Charlie Mungo are, you know, different leagues. Like, Charlie's much superior. But... In investing, it's a journey, and you want that journey to be nourishing to you and not to be detracting from you. When you kind of spend time doing this, you want to you want to end the day on a positive and say, okay, you know, it's things are working out in my favor, and you don't want it to be in a situation where everything is red and blood, you need to get yourself all nervous. And yeah, and that's my little spiel for today. Um, hope you guys found that helpful. Um, do you want to ask any questions? I don't think so. Um, actually, I was thinking, we met with the Fidelity guy, and my husband is the nervous Nelly um, of taking his portfolio and half of it, cashing it out at some point. I'm waiting for the market to come up more um, and just put it in, you know, because now we get 5%. Mm -hmm. You know, and just put half of it in 5%. Yeah. Give him his peace of mind and let the other half ride in the market. And and as you said, 
we have plenty of money to take us a long time and that additional money, you know, will just grow and whatever. Yeah, so, so I think that it's important to, that's a good approach. Um, I, I, perhaps just for, for discussion, uh, an equally good uh, approach would be put, uh, let's say, for example, uh, 20 or 25% into cash as well. You know, cash is very, just keep it as cash. And you, you, you'll you see that actually it's quite liberating. It's like this kind of um, weight of your, of your chest because then you like, if things go sour, you know, markets can sometimes go sour and they can stay sour for um, 18, two years, 18 months, two years. And objectively, it's not a particularly cheap market. Even now, you know, people are like, oh, it's fixed down. Like things are really expensive still. Uh, and, you know, there's no rationale for, as you said, correctly so, interest rates are 5%. That's guaranteed. No questions asked. You get 5%. That's like a price to earnings of 20, if you invert it wrong. And uh, and if you think about it, um, it's you can get guaranteed five percent, or you can go into these kind of bubbly things that are priced, let's say, at sixty times earnings, for example, hypothetically, or even fifty times earnings, loads of fifty times earnings stocks, and there's no guarantee with those. Expectations are very very high, so I think that cash. A lot of people will think like you. Why shouldn't I just get 5%? 5% is quite is very reasonable, you know? Um, mm -hmm. 5% over time is really, really good. So what, why should I take so much risk? Uh, right. And I think that that's perfectly valid. But I also think that for peace of mind, it's quite liberating. Maybe just 15% in cash, keeping some cash on the side. It, nothing is wrong. You're never going to miss the market. I said this at the start, you know, like the market over here, nothing goes up or down in a straight line. And, you know, I try my hardest to find things that I think are cheap, but the market as a whole is not particularly cheap right now. And if you can get 5% and an endowment can get 5%, why should they be chasing, I don't know, like Microsoft is 30, 35 times earnings. I mean, this, like this, Microsoft is having a good spell. I know that, I know that very, very well, but nothing is guaranteed. There was back in the day, General Motors was like the untouchable beast, right? And before that, it was like Stat Oil and Cisco. You know, nothing lasts forever. You know, yeah. every business has a day in the sunshine and then it goes. So Microsoft right now looks amazing, but you're an endowment, let's say at MIT, and you have a load of money to deploy somewhere. Do you really want to chase something at 35 times earnings or you just park it at 5%? No one's going to fire you for getting 5%, right? So yeah. just... Yeah. 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 Uh, Michael, I'd like to ask you about open. Um, yeah. You just recently did an article, I guess yesterday about, you know, strong buy. Um, and how safe is that stock? Because I'm thinking I should maybe put a little extra in there. It's so low uh, and you have good, uh, big faith in it. And I have faith in you <laughs> having faith in it. Um, so uh, my question is, uh, uh, do you think that can ride out any storm? And uh, do you think this is a great uh, time to buy some more of that? So, you know, I'm biased, right? Because I own this stock. So uh, everything that I say, you got to think about that, right? Because I'm biased. Because it's a stock that I own. I'm very passionate about it. But there was a time last year where I was not sure. I wasn't sure if they were going to make it out. I was really uncertain. But now... Like, I think that the, I think they're going to make it. There's a question of whether they're going to, like, thrive. That's even out of the question. Like, whether they'll survive. I think they're going to make it. I think they're going to make it. And I can see that. I know they get a lot about press for, um, for having, uh, like, debt on their balance sheet. But the debt is tied to the houses. It's not tied to the business. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that they use this proxy, which... It's not great, but they use this proxy of adjusted earnings to represent their cash flows because they're free cash flow. If they're buying a house and they can really sap up 
that free cash flow, but then when they sell the house, there's a lot of free cash flow coming back. But they use this adjusted net earnings figure, which kind of they say, and I, over time it has kind of leveled up with free cash flow. So some quarters, they have more free cash flow than net earnings. And some quarters, they have less free cash flow than net earnings. But it does kind of even out, but it's quite seasonal, right? Because people normally buy houses in, in spring and June, really, which is Q2 and Q3. Uh, and then, you know, the, the, the real estate market kind of slows down as it goes into winter. And I think that from my perspective, I don't, by Q2 of next year, which is, you know, it's 10 months really, um, they will have gone over the worst of the storm. Because as, as, as Boo said, you know, interest rates are 5%, that means mortgages are 8%. And if they can navigate this period right now, where the real estate market is kind of really in tenterhooks, um, if they can get through this, I think that they're going to do quite well. And you have to remember that they came from a period where interest was zero. So people were just buying and selling and it was a really hot real estate market. But it's really just shrunk and cooled down. And now it's a lot more stable because for better or worse, people still kind of need to buy and sell, move out of their parents' home. You know, it's real estate is like back from the ages. It's just, it's just you know, over time goes up. It does go through cycles like everything but i think that open has survived the worst of it that was last year and i know that the share price came up a lot and down a lot but realistically i f i mean i think they're going to make it now that doesn't mean like george you like you you put 25 percent of your capital in there but you know i advocate which i think is fair just every so often like four to six weeks apart you, you put like one or two percent of your portfolio and you build a position up, let's say 5% or so of your portfolio. And once you get there, you sit on your hands. That's the most difficult thing for an investor. Investor feels they have to react to the share price. Share price is down, they need to do something. Share price is up, they need to do something. It's okay to just learn to sit on the hands. So if you have, let's say, a reasonable amount already in there, it's, you know, don't, don't feel like you have to react. Just, it's okay to kind of, but if you don't, I think that, the, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very much inclined to buy some of myself here because I think that uh, I think you're going to make it and I don't think anyone believes yeah. they're going to make it yeah and I and I appreciate that last comment too that uh you know when it's down that low maybe buy a little bit more yeah. uh because it is a greater value thank you Michael thank you so much um Hey, both of you. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Um I hope you guys have a nice week and uh, got the next the earnings season's coming up now it's a very volatile period. Um, yeah, I'm really, you know, hope everything goes well for your portfolios and um, see you next week. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.